we are very much looking forward to a new insight into the Genevan archives and the expert and forensic witnesses in the Genevan trials between 1540 and 1640. So with that very brief introduction, Bill, over to you. Thanks, Karen, I appreciate it. So um, although this paper is designed primarily to consider the role of the medical practitioners and the exercise of justice in early modern Geneva, it's important to note at the outset that a number of types of crimes will not be discussed in what follows. If this thing would allow me to do page advance. There we go. OK. First, crimes involving child abuse. In every case in which someone under the age of about 16 was the victim of an alleged sexual assault, the courts heard a report from medical authorities. If the child was male, the report was prepared by a panel of doctors and barber surgeons. Female victims were examined by midwives. The reports were brief and for the most part confirmed that sexual activity had had or had not taken place. A positive report always led to a conviction. A negative report resulted either in an outright acquittal or a not proven verdict. This paper will also avoid a discussion of fornication and prostitution cases. Most of these contained reports by midwives on the physical evidence of sexual activity. The defendant was necessary for reasons. Likewise, those cases where a defendant claimed to be pregnant to avoid or postpone her sentence will also be ignored. Basically, these reports are all variations on a theme. The examination of the private parts of the woman to discover information on her sexual history. The one important point to note is that these reports were not uncommon. Fornication, after all, was not a rare crime. In fact, it's about a tenth of the surviving criminal court cases of which there are 30,000 surviving court cases. And, and that meant that the courts were in frequent contact with and regularly re relied upon midwives in particular. So this paper is not going to focus on, if you will, sort of the sexual cases that in some way involve medical practitioners. Rather, we'll consider the ways in which Geneva's magistrates oversaw, controlled and regulated medicine and medical practitioners on a more mundane daily level. This may be less exciting, but it is to be hoped it will demonstrate the keen interest the city's rulers had in medicine and its application. To provide the fullest context for the discussion which follows, um, I, I'll a, um, a handout and a, a little um, sort of pie chart. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm working with about 60 cases involving medical practitioners, which form the core of this paper. And although it's over a century, in actual fact, the bulk of them are in sort of um, 1560 to about 1590. So the first case is especially interesting as it's an example not only of the state's active interest in medicine, but also of its practitioners dragging the magistrates into medicine. In 1607, Dr. Matthieu de Thiel and his physician's sons accused Magno Catalino, a doctor from Piedmont, of stealing their patients. That was the preliminary accusation. But when the, the court case got going, they charged him with a number of other things. For, exact, for example, quackery claiming that as a chemical doctor, his remedies were merely antimony and mercury. The state was interested in ensuring good medicine for Geneva's populace, but the magistrates were hardly up to adjudicating in a Galenic versus Paracalcian debate. But the first case immediately highlights the key to understanding the interaction of the state and medicine in early modern Geneva, the provision of good medicine and the maintenance of good health. First and foremost, this involved plague. In 1546, near the end of one of Geneva's worst outbreaks, Amy Cartier, a fumigator, was prosecuted. He was accused of mingling with healthy people after having worked in infected houses. His defense was that he employed a foolproof preservative. He washed his hands and mouth with his The city was less than impressed. He was flogged through the streets and banished on pain of death should he ever return. Um, there are a number of cases where the city finds itself faced with traditional remedies and cures and has to decide whether they think these things actually work or whether they're problematic. Uh, that was a particularly good example of it. Of course, the major weapon against 
weapons against plague were not fumigation or quarantine. The need to employ these measures meant that the city's defenses had failed. Rather, the key to preventing plague was halting it at the city's borders at best, or at least identifying the first cases so any potential outbreak could be nipped in the bud. This forced the city to introduce Italian-style examinations of the sick and the dead by its medical practitioners, in particular, barber surgeons. On occasion, this meant an actual autopsy. And in fact, autopsies occur much more frequently in the late 16th century than the current literature would leave one to believe. Not dissection, but autopsy. In 1556, the body of a young child, Jacques Jacquemot, was dissected by Philippe Cerezan, Guillaume de Saint-Marie, Pierre Tissot, and Jean de Biolay. The deceased child had died in the plague hospital. Now, you would think that it was a plague death. However, the report contained a detailed descriptions of the child's internal organs and concluded that the said child is dead only of dysentery, not plague. A similar report in 1616 was commissioned after the sudden death of an 11-year-old girl. Plague was not present, though the child did have two or three blemishes on her stomach. They don't come into what they think they are, they just say that it's not plague. Geneva's reliance on autopsy did not, however, imply approval for dissection. And I think this is an important point because dissection is talked quite a bit, talked about quite a bit in the 16th century in the historic historiography, but less about autopsy. In 1636, the city was rocked by the case of the surgeon Frederick Canadel. He had a fascination for anatomy and testified that he was keen to recreate the skeletons of cats, dogs, and humans that he had seen during his studies in various German universities at Bern and Padua. To this end, he defleshed cats and dogs. Also, he had paid a grave digger to give him any bones that he might come across at the city's plague pits um, when new graves are being dug up. Various servants and students also testified telling of his dissection of a female child. His maid servant had watched the dissection and been disgusted to hear Canadell and a student commenting on the child's privates. A few leading medical practitioners reported they had seen his skeletons, including that of a child mounted on a wicker frame. They had been repulsed and said so, he had laughed at them. The scandal spread rumors across the city. To calm the situation, the body of a child rumored to be the source of his skeleton was exhumed to prove she was not the source of the bones. Two months, two months after her burial, her body was intact, still in its funeral clothes. These cases combined the licit and illicit um, handling of bodies. They delineated the boundary between acceptable acceptable medical practice and criminal scandalous science, as Canada called his skeletons. The next case continues this theme and introduces the most important concern in Geneva out of these 60 cases that I was working with, the control of dangerous substances. Magistrates actively investigated any contravention of the city's ordinances on plagues, and they were fairly detailed. All the apothecaries had to keep effectively poison books registering the sale of any poison and who had bought it, and these were examined by the, the city regularly and in extraordinarily in cases. Now, Solomon Gentil was a citizen and a magistrate in charge of poor relief and his trial was a cause celeb in 1630. He was accused of trying to prevent the autopsy of Gideon Boschu. The death certificate issued on the night of Boschu's death blamed his de demise on a fever and hernia. Public opinion was again not satisfied. Boschu lodged with Gentil and one of the serving maids said he had looked poison. Boschu's father also said that his son thought he had been poisoned while he was dying. He, said this to his father, and had died vomiting up matter colored black, yellow, and green. He was convinced that Gentil had poisoned his son for financial reasons. The city seized the papers of both Gentil and Boschu, revealing um, various forms of debt of 9,000 florins, and Gentil himself owed Boschu about 700 florins. He claimed and his wife corroborated that he had paid the debt with interest. However, he had no receipts. Suspicion had fallen on Gentil when he tried to stopped the physicians and surgeons from taking the body for autopsy. The court remained undecided and he was acquitted, but interestingly, he was sacked from his position in the city's poor relief. 
Several cases demonstrate the interplay of civic regulations and professional responsibility with the desire of the customer to purchase controlled substances. Francois Bertelier, an apothecary, was tried for selling arsenic to Guillaume Pitons. She was a maid servant to Jean-Francois de Balisson, whose husband was a local laird who had died suddenly. So the implication is, is that the serving girl had bought the poison and supplied it to the wife who didn't kill her husband. Bertolet maintained that he had obeyed the regulations and had not sold poison to anyone except surgeons, physicians, surgeons, and physician merchants, and produced his, his poison book to back up his claim. Indeed, he said he had not discussed this particular poison, arsenic, for years, except with a local physician, Louis Belchiquet, um, who's interestingly mentioned because he's actually on the Senate and therefore sitting in judgment, um, and only in the context of a possible prescription. Although there were flaws in his story, the supporting testimony of socially prominent character witnesses, such as Belchiquet, resulted in his acquittal. His acquittal. There were also poison cases where the state was willing to accept mitigation. Two will serve as excellent examples. In 1563, Jean Jantin was arrested after being reported by an apothecary for trying to buy poison. He freely admitted the charge and said he wanted to poison a priest who had raped his 15-year-old sister. The priest had been convicted by a neighboring Catholic jurisdiction, but pardoned by the bishop in exile of Geneva. And it's worth remembering that Geneva is completely surrounded by um, Catholic territory and actually within walking distance from the city. John's friends and family appealed saying he was a poor man responsible for a wife and children, a worker and manual laborer standing here even as he is clothed only in his meager quality in a good and honest life and conversation by God's grace without ever having been accused or convicted of any crime without any blame or reproach before men. The court took this into account, but still sentenced him to death, saying, your preceding good and honest life and conversation, having acted from the just sorrow that you felt from the dishonoring of your house in the person of your sister, who had been violated and corrupted in her youth by rape. <clears throat> However, his sentence was appealed to the larger council, the Council of 200, and was overturned, and interestingly enough, commuted simply to court costs. A similar leniency was shown to Eustache Lory in 1608 when he tried to buy poison from another apothecary. He readily confessed that he wanted to murder the priest cohabiting with his mother. He was convinced that the priest would deplete the family's meager wealth to the detriment of his four younger siblings. He was flogged and banished, but not sentenced to death. In fact, clearly the city was rather broad-minded about the treatment of Catholic priests violating their vows of celibacy and people taking um, the law into their own hands. While concerned about the use of drugs, the state was also troubled by the work of individual medical practitioners. We now turn to consider the second largest type of crime, malpractice. In 1647, Antoine Plantin, a citizen, and the servant of Georges Dupuis, apothecary and also citizen, was arrested for manslaughter. Two prescriptions had been received in the apothecary shop. Plantin, the assistant, had prepared one which had been left in Dupuis's absence. This appears to have been a prescription left at the apothecary shop for a young girl by Dr. Leclerc. When Plant had asked about the medicine on the shelf which he had prepared, he was told by Dupuis, who had returned, but who had not looked at it, that it was for Monsieur Amy. Clearly, Dupuis assumed that Amy's prescription had been mixed by the servant and that the prescription for de Leclerc's patient was not yet prepared, when in fact it was the other way around. When Amy's wife arrived, Dupuis was again out of the shop, so there was no chance that the mistake could have been identified at the last minute. Amy died almost immediately after taking the medication, which had been designed for the young girl. Um, I don't imagine it was probably going to do her a great deal of good either. Dupuis was given a sharp rebuke by the court for failing to leave clear instructions with his assistant. The picture one gets is of a rather chaotic shop in which prescriptions were left lying about by physicians and prepared by either the apothecary or his assistant with no labels. Both men on the shop relied on one another to do their task correctly and to communicate effectively. In the end, this relaxed yet hectic situation 
proved fatal. Malpractice, however, was not the sole prerogative of apothecaries or male medical providers. One other area was ripe for such a charge, childbirth. The next case demonstrates the state's interest in and oversight of the work of the city's midwives or wise women. And as I said at the outset, in fact, it's, it's midwives that the state has the most regular contact with. In 1623, Claude Grimbert was arrested for the manslaughter of Louis Mermet's wife. Depositions were taken from the husband, four women and apothecary, all of whom were in the birthing chamber. The apothecary Louis de la Mer said Gribert had torn from the body of the said Mermo pieces of flesh, and this violently. The wife had then bled to death, but the child had lived. The midwife was acquitted. The magistrates accepted the general thrust of the defense advanced by the midwife. Birth was dangerous and violent. As she put it, such things sadly were all too often part of childbirth. However, when it came to death and the unborn, the state was considerably yes, less understanding. While seemingly sanguine about the providential death of a woman or child in birth, the state saw abortions as an unacceptable crime. Now, the, the next case will suffice to shed light on the attempts by the state to stop abortions. One must note that, that the abortion refers not to infanticide, that's a different category, or to abortions engineered by the pregnant woman alone. Instead, these refer to someone assisting in an abortion. In 1620, Claude Severin, a Catholic priest, was arrested for trying to buy a drug to make a young girl abort. He claimed he was on a commission from a gentleman of importance of his parish who had got the girl in trouble. He had approached two apothecaries. And, and of course, one of the things that's interesting about this is this idea of a Catholic parish priest wandering around Geneva trying to buy stuff. Um, at his first interrogation, he claimed he was working on behalf of a gentleman named Monsieur Jean-Baptiste de Villette to acquire some remedies to make a girl have her periods which had ceased for about two months. In his first three interrogations, he gave three different aliases. He confused the name of the supposed gentleman and was undecided if the girl was to miscarry or menstruate. The magistrates obviously became very suspicious about this guy. At his fourth interrogation, he admitted his real name and the name of the peasant girl. He said that they had had sex but he said she was not pregnant, rather she was suffering from her failure to menstruate. He denied having three children or having been censured by his bishop. It's obvious that Geneva had got information from his local area. He claimed he was always held in good repute. He admitted his fornication and that he had offended God greatly, but denied wanting to cause an abortion. Three of his relatives, Jean-Jacques Gelet, Gaspard Savarin and Francois Balouche, wrote an appeal on his behalf and later promised to pay the substantial fine of 200 écus, though they said if possible they'd like to pay it over time. They also claimed the drug was to cause the girl to menstruate and the priest had only sought it because she had continually implored him. Effectively, they downplay any fornication. They added that leniency should be shown because their relative was a complete imbecile in the mind as the court must have already realized. Considering Geneva's historic enthusiasm for dealing harshly with sexually active priests, one must surmise that social prominence and diplomatic niceties saved the rather foolhardy Savarin. These cases, along with those relating to poison, highlight the problems associated both with drugs as well as with traditional remedies. Not only were well-known medications dangerous, but there was a host of other substances and compounds readily available capable of causing harm. The state could not control all of them. My final case for consideration combines several of the factors I've touched upon. It is a clear case of professional misconduct, the attempted rape of a female patient. In 1570, Nicholas Arvel was prosecuted for trying to rape Genevieve de No while she was a patient in the plague hospital. She was the wife of Bonaventure Bertrand Cornet, a Genevan minister and professor of Hebrew at the academy. And the social prominence of the husband suggests that, that this can't be just a, a crime of opportunity. 
Nicholas had made repeated advances at Genevieve and she had resisted. Eventually, he had thrown her on a bed while treating her. She had again successfully resisted. Coladon advised that the crime was domestic and against all rights of sociability and hospitality. Had the attack been successful, it would have amounted to double adultery as both were married. Coladon is suggesting that this isn't perhaps rape. When questioned, a servant girl said she had rushed into the room and her mistress had said the surgeon had committed an act of an evil man and had an ought to have his head cut off. In his version, Nicholas said he had needed to apply a poultice to her groin, in other words, to a bubo, and that she had raised her skirts right up to her stomach without even trying to conceal her privates such that he was tempted to fornicate. Initially, they had kissed and then she had stopped the proceedings and promised to say no more about the matter. He had fled the house and gone immediately to Pierre Tiso, another surgeon to whom he had told his version. There is little doubt that he hoped to solicit the support of a colleague and to ensure that there was a witness among the city's elite to his version of events. Eventually, the case produced information that implied that Nicholas was less than chaste. For example, he was implicated in affairs with married women in Lyon. Yet again, the city's in conversation with other areas roundabout about people. Moreover, admitted his wife was pregnant by one of their servants. His dissolute life was counterbalanced in the eyes of the magistrates and their legal advisor by the reputation of over-familiarity between Nicholas and Genevieve. There is little doubt that things had happened between them and that Genevieve had then refused his further advances. The, course was, the court was less certain to what extent she had acquiesced in the first place. That he was pilloried and banished and nothing done to her would suggest that the court err, decided to err on the side of caution in her case. Throughout these cases, one senses the difficulties Geneva faced in controlling and regulating medicine and medical practitioners. One also sees the rise of nascent professionalism and attempts by some types of practitioners to protect their craft. Thus, one also notes efforts by local medics to prevent newcomers from establishing themselves in the city. The chaotic nature of much of the provision of medicine is equally evident. Perhaps most interesting is the extent to which medicine remained a do-it-yourself enterprise. Traditional remedies vied with learned prescriptions. Women had a clear and secure place in the system as midwives and as expert witnesses, helping to maintain social mores and values. Women do not appear marginalized in Genevan medicine, though they are largely restricted to gynecological roles. One is also struck by the intrusion of the state into medicine. Leading Genevans did not just attempt to punish malpractice and the misuse of poison. They adjudicated in professional disputes. They delineated professional distinctions, and they sat in judgment on prescriptions and medical procedures. Obviously, the presence of several apothecaries on the Senate and therefore the Supreme Court made this easier but it still meant that merchants, drapers, and other artisans were taking an active part in controlling, regulating, and judging the medical profession. While one might doubt the magistrate's competence, as one might doubt the competence of early modern medical practitioners, the medics never questioned this role for the state. Medicine was not self-regulating in Geneva. It was firmly under the gaze and thumb of the state. The state enforced its morality and religious views on medicine and its practitioners. The state decided who could and could not practice medicine and what areas of medicine were open to them. The state intimately involved itself in the minutia of medicine. On the other hand, the state was also heavily dependent upon its medical practitioners, especially expert witnesses on fornication, rape, and murder trials. Justice would not and could not have functioned as it did without them. They provided the judges with detailed medical information on drugs, diseases, and bodies. Indeed, some of their more technical reports must have been inaccessible to the judge magistrates. And yet, sentences often to death were frequently dependent upon this expert testimony. Just as no medic questioned the role of the state in medicine, no magistrate questioned the role of medical practitioners in the administration and execution of justice. These Genevan cases present an impression of a symbiotic relationship between the state and medicine, between judges and medics. Both were intimately involved in each other's professions. Both accepted each other's involvement. This is all the more striking a relationship one recalls, as these cases suggest, 
that non-learned traditional medicine and medical practitioners were also part of this symbiotic relationship. In Geneva, judges, lawyers, apothecaries, surgeons, physicians, midwives, and just about anyone with a traditional remedy were all part of the interwoven tapestry that was medicine and justice in early modern Geneva. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Bill. Thank you.